Abandoned abroad, a Minnesota man has waited seven years to bring his family here legally. How wide open borders mean a different fate for thousands of others. Next. Dave Pomeroy is my guest. Dave, thank you so much for joining me. I know you're joining us uh, from Panama, where you're living now with your wife and, and five children, uh, but really appreciate the time. Thank you for having me. I think eventually, Dave, uh, your entire story is going to be a movie one day, but but for this conversation, I just uh, just for background, set the scene. You are a U.S. citizen, born and raised here in Minnesota, uh, spending basically your first 40 years here. Is that right? Yeah, uh, I was born and raised in the North Metro, uh, graduated from Coon Rapids High School. Um, in my 30s, I traveled the U.S., but that was a, for work, and that was about it. So, you know, it, when I hit the age of 42, that was the first time I ever left the country. And then you leave the country, you meet your wife, uh, who is from Belarus, a country, uh, just for context, in Eastern Europe, bordered by Ukraine and, and Russia. She has two children. Uh, you end up staying there. But then I know you run into problems pretty early on uh, bringing your wife and children back to the U.S. Yeah, I, we originally got married in Belarus um, because she had existing children. It would make the fiancé visa a little bit difficult, at least from a Belarus perspective. So we made the decision to get married in Belarus. The original plan was for me to spend 30 days there. And at the end of that 30 days, I'd come home and we'd start going through the spousal visa process, but she found a way for me to be able to stay in Belarus. And since I worked remotely, I talked to my boss, he was okay with it. So we made the plans. I stayed in Belarus and we spent the next four years there <laughs> um, at going through a lot of chaos with this very complicated process. Gosh, and talking about chaos, I think it's, it's pretty safe to say things are scary it's clear you're not you're not wanted in belarus as an american uh, i know you're you're targeted you've talked about you had beer bottles thrown at you bags of garbage uh thrown at you uh someone even who burned holes uh in, in your baby stroller just talk about talk about that yeah so when i first got there things were pretty nice um people really didn't pay much attention uh shortly after we got married uh my wife's father died and that was kind of the moment where a, a, a small group of people within the, the small town of about 11,000 started to take notice that they had an American that was living amongst them and showed no signs of leaving. Uh, the incident started off pretty mild. You know, people would be yelling at me, go home, you American, uh, in perfect English. Uh, but it, it, it escalated to a point of, yeah, like you said, I had beer bottles thrown at me from three and four story balconies. I got hit by one of them and have bags of garbage tossed at me. And then when our son Calvin was born, uh, there was one particular trip where we made to the grocery store. And when we came out of the grocery store, we found cigarettes burnt through the canopy. Uh, and shortly after that, things really started to escalate. Uh, the stroller had been vandalized multiple times. My wife's kids were now being alienated in school and on the playground. We'd go to the playground and people would pull their kids off the playground and take them home. Uh, and then I think the, the point where it really became clear that being in a small town was a problem was when I was assaulted at one of the uh, outdoor holiday festivals. Uh, a little kid came up and kicked me really, really hard, said something in Russian, and then ran back, and both his parents were basically giving me the American bird salute. Um, and it was just very clear that I was not welcome there. But then ultimately, um, just fast forward a bit to this um, trip to Jamaica. It's supposed to be a trip um, to, to relax a bit. Uh, COVID hits, and then you're stuck in Jamaica. We moved out of the small town, we moved into another town. And then about a year later, the election happened in Belarus. And that was the point in which uh, the government was sending the police out and they were killing peaceful protesters. 
they were blaming things on America, uh, which for that entire year we were living in that town, we didn't have any issues until that election. And then it got to a point where we started seeing things, things were happening to my stepson at school. The teachers and the staff were starting to bully him. So we decided to take a trip to Jamaica. I had a friend there. Um, it was intended to be three months, just hoping to relax and get away from it for a little bit. About a week before our return flight to Europe, I got an email saying that our flight was canceled. No reason, but it was right at the time when most of Europe was locking down because of COVID. And because my wife needed a visa just to travel, uh, we essentially became stuck in Jamaica and things went downhill from there. And all the while, over all of these years, you're doing your best, doing everything you, you can to get back to the United States. I know the U.S. Embassy in Jamaica then is, is no help. Uh, they want you to go back to, to Belarus. Uh, but then it's February of, of 2022. The U.S. Embassy is, has suspended operations due to the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine in, in Belarus. Uh, just, just talk about what, what's, what's going on as far as uh, you, you know, your, your family at, at that point. I know you're spending tens of thousands of dollars, it sounds like, on lawyers uh, just desperate uh, to get back home. Yeah. It, the, the, the whole point was my, my primary focus is to be able to keep my family together. Um, which is I, which is something that I think a, a lot of people don't quite understand about the immigration process is, you know, you hear people that take seven years to get through this. Well, it, yeah, a lot of times that's seven years that you're apart and you're lucky if you can go and visit for a few days or a week. You know, not pe not a lot of people have the type of job that allows that. Um, so I've been fortunate in the fact that I do have a remote job. Um, but like you said, it's cost us countless thousands of dollars to jump through hoops to be able to try to stay compliant with the laws and regulations of Jamaica um, and still be able to make progress on our U.S. immigration visa. And like you said, the, the, the U.S. Embassy, unfortunately, was about zero help. Uh, and, the, and the worst part is that we get a lot of conflicting information from the various different government entities. Uh, one embassy tells us that this is the process. Another embassy tells us this is the process. And I, it's been a nightmare, to, to put it bluntly. It's, it's been an absolute nightmare. But fortunately, my kids are they're still, they're coping very well with this. Um, they, they sort of understand what's going on. Um, but they also know that they're missing out on a lot of what most people would call is a normal childhood. So you go from Jamaica then to Panama, uh, where you've been since February of 22. I know you've, you've added uh, a couple of family members uh, since then. You, you want to bring your family uh, to Minnesota. Bring us, bring us up to date with the, the latest now, where things uh, stand at this point. The U.S. Embassy in Panama agreed to take our case if we could get to Panama. So we made every effort to cleanly leave Jamaica, be able to enter into Panama, and since we've been here, uh, the U.S. Embassy actually called us after we arrived to schedule our first appointment. We went and met with them. We got uh, Calvin's, my, my, uh, our youngest son, um, his CRBA, and a few other things straightened out. Um, but like you said, since then, we had our own Panama surprise. Uh, we have the birth of our baby twin daughters. Um, and then it, the hoops that we've had to jump through to try to keep that uh, compliant with Panamanian laws. And, uh, you know, there's just there's so much different paperwork that has to be filed. And because our change in location, that has probably been one of the biggest hurdles with all of this, uh, because the National Visa Center needs to mail us, mail my wife a, a packet of information and every time we move, we have to give, file an update of address. Um, and so trying to find stable housing when we're now currently illegal in Panama, or at least I am. My wife actually just got a temporary residency uh, because of our twins. But at this point, it's still, we've got a lot of unanswered questions. We, there's, we're kind of stuck in, between a rock and a hard place because my wife and her two kids, my two stepkids, 
their passports are now expired. And the only way that we can get those renewed is if my wife and they return to Belarus. And unfortunately, because we've been out of Belarus long enough, um, the kids haven't been in school. Uh, so they're in violation of Belarusian law, which means there's a possibility that she could get arrested upon arrival. Um, so it, it's one of those trying to figure out the right path at this point is we've literally fallen through the cracks and now we're stuck between this game of whack-a-mole between four different countries. And, it, and it's frustrating. Well, and speaking of that frustration, you know, there is someone like you who spent seven years uh, tr to try to get back. Um, you see the, the news, of course, thousands uh, streaming over every day illegally. In fact, the number of backlogged immigration cases uh, in Minnesota has gone from nearly 3,000 in 2013 to 32,000 at the end of 2023. What do you make of, of the difference here? What's that like for someone like, like you to watch? Well, I, I think it's important to understand that I understand the, the need for immigration. And I, I feel for the people that have come into the United States looking for help. Um, but for somebody like me in our position, it's extremely frustrating to see that the doors are basically swung wide open and all of the accommodations that are being made for people who are breaking the law. And then there's my family and we're not alone. There's thousands of us that are in the in similar situations where we're trying to do this legally. We're trying to do the right thing. And yet we're having doors closed in our face again and again and again. Um, and the, the worst part about all of this is that in the seven years that I've been gone, I've lost my brother. I've lost my aunt and uncle. I've lost multiple friends. Haven't been able to even come to terms with how much my home life has changed because I haven't been able to be there because I'm putting my family first and my parents are getting up there in age. My mom's health is failing and there's a possibility that she will never be able to hold her grandchildren. Your story certainly speaks to this broken system. Yeah, hopefully we'll get it figured out. I mean, like I said, at this point, we're kind of stuck in limbo. Um, so at this point, we're trying to get a little more creative. Uh, the biggest hang up that we're having right now is the fact that my wife's got a Belarusian passport um, and it's expired. And so we're looking at a fast track route of trying to be able to get a passport for either Panama or another country through legal means. And that will at least allow us then to be able to enter the United States under whatever terms that we can at that point, again, legally, and hopefully be able to rectify the situation from that point. But right now where things stand, we don't know of any legal way forward. Well, Dave Pomeroy, we certainly wish you the very best. I think we'll continue to, to track your story and, and hope for good news. But thank you so much for, for joining me. Thank you. I appreciate it. That will do it for this episode of Liz Collin Reports. We'll see you next time.